Hey guys and girls, Poker Tin King here back with another card video. I hope you all are well. It's extremely hot here in England. Uh, a little bit of a heat wave here. This is the start of our summer. So, what are we going to start with? What are we going to talk about today? So today we're going to talk about what would a card game need to do to be successful in 2024. So this will be, you know, a discussion for that might be useful for card game creators now or people that are just curious as to what would happen. So if a card game came out in 2024, how do I think it would go about doing so? Uh, this is a question that I've been asked by, you know, certain card game creators in the past uh, and present, as well as people in general. I think it's a really good topic. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about is Kickstarter versus the more traditional route of investment. So if you're gonna talk about Kickstarter, obviously you've got games like MetaZoo, Akora, Grand Archive, Sorcery. They're some of the main ones. There are others, obviously, I'm sorry if I haven't listed your favorite, but they're the ones that come to my mind when I think of Kickstarter TCGs. Um, and I've, I've talked about whether or not we're the kind of at the end of Kickstarter TCGs. I don't think we, necessarily at the end, I think people are gonna be a bit more picky and choosy with the games that they put their money and time into. Um, just because we've seen quite a few failed stories now, I think people are going to be a bit more selective, which makes sense. I don't think that uh, many of them will actually survive, honestly. Uh, very few of them. I think Sorcery and Grand Archive are probably the ones that are doing the best. Um, obviously, Sorcery has announced its second set. Um, it's, well, technically first expansion, really. Um, and Grand Archive seems to be taken over. But... That versus the traditional method of raising funds is you can either obviously, you know, put your own money into it or uh, you gain investment through other avenues as companies have done in the past. Like LSS did, obviously they didn't use the Kickstarter model, even though a lot of them, a lot of people feel like they grouped uh, MetaZoo and Flesh and Blood together. They didn't go down the Kickstarter route. They did their own thing. Uh, they raised money through getting investment from you know, uh, an investment group, which is generally how a lot of restaurants, I know my expertise is in restaurants and I know that's how a lot of restaurants do it. Um, they will usually get an investment group and they kind of oversee some things. Uh, they obviously take a percentage of the profit um, for, you know, X amount of money or, you know, they take a percentage of the company. So you've got that kind of risk. If you do it with Kickstarter, you obviously, you don't have to pitch um, like you would do the more traditional route. And I think that's something that worries me, I think, with a lot of these Kickstarter games, is when I'm in, when I'm looking at a game, am I looking at just the game or am I looking at the people and the company behind it? So when you look at games like Flesh and Blood, uh, you know, LSS looks like a well-fleshed out and established company. Uh, you obviously have James White. When it comes to things like selling and, you know, marketing, People buy from who they like and having somebody like James White at the forefront of that, who is a likeable person, he does you know a lot of talks, he does interviews, he's at events. People can get to know who he is and they can go, right, do you know what, I this guy's, you know, I, I like him, I like what he's got, you know, he's got the uh, gift of the gab. So that helps with selling a product like a card game. Uh, whereas if you're doing, you know, things like Kickstarters and stuff, and you don't know who's behind it, um, it's a little bit difficult. Um, sometimes it might not be a real name used, or you might generally just not see the person behind it. You might hear, you know, they might do a little bit of a story of like, I've been in card games for this amount of time or whatever, but you don't get to see who they are. And that's quite important for me. Um, also, you know, understanding, does this company have a plan for when the game gets successful? So that is a, co a conversation I had recently um, is, okay, they have a plan for when the game releases, for getting this game you know, out there, but do they have a plan for when the game becomes successful? Uh, and I think a lot of the time these companies don't, and they go, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And obviously they get there and they're like, well, okay, um, we, shit, we don't have a plan for this. Um, and that, um, that, you know, that preparation is key, I think. You obviously have to plan for every eventuality because the game might not be successful. Um, you look at games like Akora, where I don't think they really planned ahead because they were basically they were pre-selling the next, the most recent set they were doing, 
uh, they said it was limited to a thousand box. Um, if the demand is lower, then is it really limited? Like we're going to print a thousand boxes, but are you going to sell a hundred? You know, does it matter? So they said they were limited to a thousand boxes, but they needed that the funds raised from that to be able to pay to print that set, which to me is a huge red flag. Um, where has the capital gone for prior sets? You know, where has all the money gone? Um, I know they did a big marketing thing with eBay, so I assume they fucking pissed a lot of that money down the drain. Um, but, you know, where'd that money go? Obviously, with BetaZoo, we know where some of the money went. Um, and a lot of the time, it will go into people's back pockets and it gets taken away from the company. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the shady doings ones of some of the card games that are involved in this. Um, but... When I am looking at that as a potential collector, player or investor, I want to know more about the company. I want to know about the person behind it, their history, what their plans are moving forward. I think having a pitch would be really key moving forward if companies are going to do that. I think you know you could you could upload a video on the Kickstarter and you could do a Q&A as well, which I think might be helpful. I think these things would be really good moving forward. Um, because there's transparency there, which is really important. You know, there might be people out there that just go, oh, shiny cards, this game looks good, money. Uh, and I think that's probably what a lot of people have done previously. And they've probably done very well from it. Um, some people would have done well, you know, if they sold early on. Uh, and then some people probably didn't do so well if they held out onto it. Um, if you haven't seen my Kickstarter video, TCG video, I highly recommend it. It did get a lot of smoke. Uh, some people really, really enjoyed it. It did really well, and then others just didn't like it. Um, but, you know, I'm not here to lie and, uh, you know, beat around the bush here. I'm very honest, and I'm straight to the point. That's the content that we make here on this channel. Um, but I highly recommend checking that out if you, you know, want something that's going to kind of, like, a, as a prequel to this video, I, I guess. This could be, you know, a sequel to that. Um, but... So Kickstarter is the option, obviously, we talked about the other avenue of investment. So what else is there? So law for me is a huge, important thing. I think the law of a card game is very important. I like that LSS had fleshed that out, that law for years before. You know, they've got a law book out there. I know that they're, I think they're hiring or they, they recently may have hired somebody to do the law because uh, I know somebody parted ways for the business. So we did have a little bit of time where there wasn't very much law. I think they've recently uh, uploaded some as of this week, um, so which is great. But a lot of people like reading the updates to the law, the articles that get put up on the Flesh and Blood website. Um, that I think is really important. I want. I'm a big fan of myself of things like Lord of the Rings. Um, so I like to know the innings now. I know I like to know, you know, why this weapon is used by this certain character. Why they have this weapon? Where did this character character originate from? You know, what are his reasonings for doing you know certain things? And you know, I like fleshed out law. I don't like it to feel rushed. I don't like them to have to build the law afterwards. I don't think you should release a game then build the law afterwards. I'm not saying that you can't adjust or you know create more going forward. Obviously, you can't build all the law before you make the whole game. But have enough you know for the first couple of sets. If that is, if your game is going to be fantasy based, I think having that is really important. Obviously, art as well is another huge thing. That's what's drawn me into a lot of card games, is the art. Um, whether you're using, you know, traditional arts or you're using, you know, AI enhanced, because I know some games do do that. Um, you know, people will have their preferences, um, but I think games like Flesh and Blood that really uh, champion the artists that they have involved the game is huge. I think, you know, having the artist alley, being able to meet the artists, the ones that, okay, you've got these cards, you know, I don't know how much information they get when they create a card. That would be an interesting one. Maybe I should get an artist on the channel. That would be quite cool. Um, but one of the things that's always interested me is that's going to be their adaption of it. You know, they're going to be, you know, given a kind of consensus of, right, this is kind of what we want to do. And then, you know, do what you feel like needs to be done. And then you've, you've, you've got these cards, which obviously we get playmats as well, and you, we get to see the full art. And some of them, I just think, how could you conceptualize that? Like, for me, I'm quite a creative person, but even then I look at some of the art in Flesh and Blood and I think, wow. And, you know, same as Magic the Gathering, there's some really beautiful cards across all the sets. 
And then you've obviously got other card games as well, which you think, you know, some of this art is absolutely amazing. That is another thing, and I think that's something that needs to be... That's what I didn't like about games um, like uh, Akora. I don't think the art was great. There was other games like Genesis, which I didn't really like the art of. Obviously, there's going to be opinion-based, you know, it is my opinion. Um, but I think, you know, investing in artists um, who are passionate. And Flesh and Blood have used artists that they don't use anymore, and they use some, you know, cons you know consistency. There's quite a lot of artists that they use that will probably do art for every set. Uh, and, you know, those ones are the ones that headliners, and you have other ones that kind of join in and do events and such. But that is another big thing, um, that if I was a card game, I would really... Uh, get chummy with some artists, have them work with you. Um, maybe they travel to some events in the future with you. I think that's a really good idea. Obviously, you've got the actual game, <laughs> the gameplay of the game. Um, that was a thing that I feel like MetaZoo might have kind of lost out on, is ensuring that... Because the game, for me, didn't really make much sense. And I, I could be wrong, um, but I didn't see ever see anyone playing MetaZoo. I always heard of people collecting and investing in MetaZoo, but I never once heard of anyone playing it. And I'm not saying that people didn't. Of course, I'm sure people did. But when a game comes out and the thing you hear the least of is people playing it, for me, that's a huge red flag. Now, I'm primarily a collector, uh, you know, or an investor of card games. And I do play card games, but that's probably, you know, the least of what I do involved in card games. If I don't hear the game being heard of, you know, that is bad for me, even though... As I just said, I'm primary collector because I understand how important that is. You know, it's a card game. It the game. It needs to be played, um, and that was a big thing um, that MetaZoo I feel like failed on. Again, Akora, I didn't hear anyone you know playing Akora. Um, Sorcery. I know people play Sorcery. I've heard of that. Um, that's still one that I'm not sure if enough people play, but I could be wrong. I think, but that game is kind of different in itself. Uh, that's kind of its own thing. Grand Archive, I know people play. Um, so obviously you've got to ensure, do you follow the traditional route? Um, you could look at games like Altered that have got a day, night and noon system, which is quite different. Obviously you've got games like Star Wars Unlimited, where you've got ground and air units um, and it's one turn, but you kind of take turns within a round sort of thing, um, which is a little bit different. Then obviously you've got games like One Piece, where I think Bandai games follow a similar pattern. They're not all the same, but they're going to do follow a similar pattern of it is just straight up turn. You have a separate resource system, as in the Don, um, and you can use those to power up. Um, but you basically attack, you know, counter block, defend or whatever. And then you've got games like Flesh and Blood, where all your cards are the resource system. You've obviously got your equipment, you've got your hero um, you know, use cards to pitch, use cards to attack, defend, vice versa. And then you've obviously got games like Yu-Gi-Oh, um, you know, where you have life points and you use cards to sacrifice a summon, but there's not really a resource system as such. You can kind of play as many cards as long as you've got, you know, if you're sacrificing or fusion summon or synchro or whatever you're doing, exceed, link, summon, pendulum, the nine million things that they've added to that game. Um, but it's you know the gameplay mechanics of it so you've got a lot of games there that can kind of be inspired and then you're looking at how do we connect with collectors um, I know you know it's you know should they be caring about collectors yes they, sh they should be um, how do we make this game collectible um, so we've you know we've made the art we've made the law we've got the gameplay we've talked about the financial back end now we're going to talk about collectors so collectors are extremely important in any card game because primarily collectors are the ones that are opening most of the product. So unless the store is selling singles, for a new game, a store will not be holding, selling singles. So you are relying on collectors because players will open some product, but the average player is not opening cases of multiple you know, card games or whatever. So it is going to be down to the collectors and investors. They're the only ones that are cracking all the product. They're the ones that are going to be going, right, I want to collect these shiny cards. They're the ones that create the market. So they're the ones that create and establish the prices that we have to work from. So when you're, you know, opening packs yourself and you go, right, I pulled this card. It's a shiny card. Okay, it's worth, you know, $20, for instance. But then you've also got the other factor of, is it playable? Does it add a premium for being playable? Because there's cards that are shiny that are not playable, but still have value because collectors want them. And then you've got cards that, 
aren't shiny but are playable that have value and then you've got cards that are both shiny and playable um so understanding i think the market of tcgs is a huge one i know the uh, lss um got people involved in the company early on to understand how the market works how collectors you know uh, work within the game and that helped early on now i think it got a little bit lost in the middle there but i think we're getting back to where we should be um but collectors are hugely important. So understanding what a collector wants, what a collector likes, what keeps them open in product. A fair EV is a, is a really big one there. But if you're creating a game, how do you how do you kind of balance that? So are you going to have cards where you can have a high rarity of cards that the same card but different art, high rarity. So players can get the cheaper versions, but they can opt to have a high rarity deck if they want to. Maybe they want to alt or foil their deck out like they do in a lot of card games. Or they can just have the cheap ones. Then you've got like in Flesh and Blood where you've got some of the playables that are the lowest rarity are simply expensive because they are just so playable. Um, you know, you've got class systems here, but you've got generics, which are obviously used in multiple decks. So cards like Art of War, Command and Conquer, E-Strike, you know, you've got Balance of Justice, uh, you know, the, the Tunic, game, uh, cards like that are generic, so they can be used by anyone, and that's why they have a good price, and that's why they come out in a premium. And they are pretty consistent in their pricing. Um, you know, Codex of Frailty, there's uh, cards from every set that kind of do that. Um, there's always at least one generic. But do you release that when you're printing sets? Is that what you put in there? So, you know, there's a variety of things there. Um, and then... Ultimately, are you going to get people involved in this game? You know, people like Rudy, people like Saint, you know, these high profile uh, investor whale types that will put a lot of money into the game. Not only money, but also their their wisdom, advice, you know, their experience and their time as well. I recognise that, you know, people like Saint, not only did he put a lot of money into the game early on, but also he was there as probably as an advisory role to, to James. Um, so he wasn't necessarily, you know, working for them as such, but, you know, he wanted to see the game do well. He believed in it. Obviously, he was in Magic prior, um, and he wanted to see the game do well. So having experts like that are really important, uh, I think, early on with a game. Now, there are going to be a lot of people that will probably dislike that theory or dislike that opinion, um, and that's absolutely fine. If you've got a huge IP... You don't need that. But if you don't, then I think having, you know, people like that, whether or not it is, you know, experts in the field, people with a lot of knowledge, with a lot of links as well, perhaps the distribution to stores, um, also content creators as well. Those are the kind of people that are going to help. So I think it's probably going to be a hard one when you're creating a game because it's like, do I just give a load of product out to a load of content creators? How does that translate to sales? Now, I don't think handing out decks and packs to... A thousand content creators is probably the best one because you're going to absolutely go through a lot of product and it's probably going to cost you a lot of money. That's extremely expensive. Um, you know, one of the big things is don't try to go toe to toe with these big companies in marketing because their budget for marketing is more than your revenue. Um, you know, their budget for marketing is in the millions, perhaps potentially billions. You will never compete with them on marketing. So you need to build these communities. You need people to to buy into you, to believe in the system, believe into the game um, and the company behind it um, and believe in the product as well. I think the project is a really big thing. How do you get people on board with the project You know, before the game comes out? I think things like UK Games Expo, Gen Con um, and Sphil, um, or Sphila, I might have absolutely butchered that. I'm really sorry. Uh, but uh, games like, you know, games expos like that are huge. And one of the things I would advise personally is don't go there to sell your product. Go there to get people involved in the product. So do demos, do learn to play demos. Maybe give out a promo when they finish the demo and they've got a card and go, oh, OK, if this game does well, this promo might be really cool. I'm going to actually use it or I might be able to collect it or, you know, sell it if you want to. But they've got a piece of that game before it comes out and they feel there's that exclusivity there. That, oh, okay, well, I did this demo at this game, you know, this expo. But learning how to play the game and understanding how the game works, maybe sell them a little bit. You're, you've got a pitch here. You're not selling them uh, money-wise, but you're selling them time-wise. 
And I think that's what's going to get people involved in more than just having a stall there where you're selling booster packs or, you know, uh, starter decks. Where people are going to walk past and go, yeah. Because look, at the end of the day, there are hundreds of card games, maybe thousands, every year that are competing with each other. Because they're not competing with Pokemon. They're not competing with Magic the Gathering. They're not competing with Yu-Gi-Oh. They're not competing with Lorcana or, you know, Star Wars that, or One Piece where there are huge IPs. They're competing with each other. There are so many card games that are coming out that are competing with each other. How do you separate yourself? Because every single one of those is going to be run by somebody who thinks they've got the key. They've got the winning ticket. You know, they've got the winning lottery ticket there. And that their game is going to be better. Now, they might have seen what other card games have done and gone, yep. But I think visiting stores, maybe speaking to other card game creators that past and present, um, you know, how did this work? What did this work? I think, um, you know, collaboration is always better than competition and learning from other people in that field, the things that they did, the things they wish they did or didn't, um, that's going to be vital. I think obviously fleshing it all out before you make the card game, uh, you know, don't go right, we're going to make the card game. Okay, now we start planning 12 months later, we're going to start a Kickstarter because the Kickstarters are almost always delayed because they never anticipate the hype. You know, you're going to get that FOMO early on where people are going to pump loads of money into it because there's going to be a lot of people that are investors that have zero uh, interest in playing or collecting the game. They are purely just going to flip it when it comes out. And that's fine because they're helping raise the money if that's what you're doing on Kickstarter. Um, so, yeah, that that's a kind of like a short, I guess, medium uh, conversation about what I would do, breaking down some of the things. Obviously, there's going to be some things that I've missed. Look, you know, card games are infinite. They're endless. You know, the nuances that come from every card game, we could be here for eight hours talking and I still wouldn't be able to cover it all. So there are just a few key points um, that I want to talk about because it's a conversation I've had recently um, and I just wanted to put it into video form. Obviously, this is the kind of video where your comments are really important. So let me know in the comments below, um, you know, some of the key points from the video that you liked, some things that you would do if you were creating a card game or some advice um, because a lot of people that are watching my content probably have quite a lot of history in card games, whether it's playing, collecting or investing or all of them. Um, maybe you did create a card game, maybe it didn't work out. Maybe you are a creator of one and it's doing really well. Um, but, you know, the people that watch my content are fairly knowledgeable on card games, I think. So let me know your thoughts below in the comments below. I would be absolutely happy to read all of them. I do respond to every comment that people leave even the bad ones, even if you're telling me I look like Jimmy Neutron or that my videos are boring, um, I will reply to your comments nonetheless. Um, hit the links in the description below. As always, we've got our Discord. We're going to try and get 100 members. Uh, the Instagram, which we just hit 10k uh, followers on Instagram, which is huge. I think we're about to hit 6k uh, subscribers on YouTube, which is big. Uh, obviously, we have TikTok, we have X. I've got it all, so hit the links in the description below. And as always, have a great day.